Welcome to Awaken Life Radio, a podcast about being a spiritual being, having a human experience in a world gone mad. Each week, we will discuss how you can heal yourself, cultivate your intuitive superpowers, and be a sacred vessel for planetary healing. I am your host, Narayani Gaya. All right, all right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Awaken Life Radio. This is Narayani Gaya, your hostess. And today I am joined by a really amazing couple and all this magic has been unfolding for this to happen. So today I'm joined by Frankie Ferrante from May I Be Frank and his beautiful partner, Jill Trenholm. Did I say that right, Jill? Yes. Did. Yes. <laughs> well, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting us. Yay. I invited Frank here because there was this amazing post that, you know, that you wrote Frankie on Gaia TV because may I be Frank movie is on Gaia TV, but I first saw may I be Frank movie. Gosh, I think it was in a group community setting in Santa Cruz, because we had a cafe gratitude in Santa Cruz and we had been connecting with the cafe gratitude community. Cause I was working on trying to launch a pilot reality show. And so we were going out to LA and we met Reverend Michael. We were a bunch of us working on a project that never happened because the friend who started then got pregnant and had a baby. And that was, that was the world vision that needed to manifest at that time. But anyway, I really got excited to see that you were posting about taking the kind of the the prestigious stigma out of spiritual ego and really grounding it with a message that um, really spoke to the, the depth and simplicity of what it means to walk a path of sacred service. And on Awaken Life Radio, I really like to inspire people. And we talk a lot about how to do your thing. That's kind of your thing. Um, You just told me before we recorded a little story about one of your mentors whose thing was to um, create community. That was his purpose. And that he was being ruled by the principle of unity. If it didn't create unity, then it's not in alignment with his purpose. And I think that's such a wonderful, simple way to think about staying focused on your journey and to help dissolve. Both of these are great examples of dissolving a lot of stigma and confusion around what it means to be spiritual. So I'd love to just, um, I'd actually love to do a little reading and then just open up really what spirituality means to both of you and kind of open the conversation that way. Does that sound good? Yes, ma'am. Yep, sounds good to me too. <laughs> okay. This is just so brilliant. So I'm going to read it for y'all and then we'll get in here with Frank and Jill. So this is from um, Frankie's words. Um, my friend Betsy Chase recently asked me to write an article about what it means to be a conscious man. My first reaction was to laugh. You're kidding me, right? No, she said, you're one of the most conscious guys I know. Well, Betsy, you obviously need to get out more. (laughs) I never thought of myself as a conscious man, maybe because of my occasional bounce with depression. Then there are those attack thoughts that assault me at around 2 a.m. The ones that mercilessly spread broken glass around my brain, reminding me of my fears, doubts, regrets, and especially those I hurt or disappointed. These days, all manner of high-minded spiritual terms are band are banded. What is this word? Are bandied about. <laughs> bandied. 
Today, we have conscious capitalism, conscious films, conscious eating, conscious coupling, conscious uncoupling, etc. All of these concepts are rooted in what I believe is a beautiful and meaning place. However, their interpretation and practical application is often a departure from the original intent, kind of the whole, like the whole Jesus thing. Mm -hmm. I believe the words spiritual and conscious have become diluted and subjective. Take films, for example. Finding Joe is a beautiful film about Joseph Campbell's work. It was informative, inspiring, entertaining, and meaningful. On the other hand, new age spiritual materialists consider the secret to be the greatest story ever told of movies. In my opinion, the secret is the national inquirer of conscious time. I love a bold statement. I live in Sedona, smack dab in the middle of the vortex and crisscrossing ley lines. Spirituality is big business here. I know I'm reading a lot, but it's just, I don't want to leave a thing out. This is so good. There is a parallel between Sedona and Los Angeles. Whatever restaurant you choose in LA, your server is more than likely an actor. In Sedona, your server at a restaurant the driver next to you at a red light, the person you bump into in hot yoga or the guy selling muscle uh, miracle cures of the CBD shop is more than likely a life coach. Uh Says laughing the life coach over here. Sedona has become a place where you may run into someone on his way to a vegan restaurant while reintegrating him from ayahuasca journey, visiting his past life therapist before attending a kirtan on his way for voting for Trump. The first casualty of people taking themselves too seriously is irony. Take, for example, the horned shaman trespassing through the Capitol on January 6th. When he went to jail, the guy said he needed organic vegan food because anything else was against his religion and made him sick. Apparently, no one noticed the irony of the organic vegan wizard shaman wearing a dead animal on his head. This year, I will be 70 years old. My parents came here from Sicily in 1947 after World War II. They brought the war with them to Brooklyn. I spent the first third of my life in terror of the Catholic nuns, gangs, the police, and my parents. The second third, I spent cooking heroin and staring at the bottom of the tumbler full of vodka and a nose full of cocaine. The last third, I've spent recovering from the first two. Now, according to Betsy, I'm a conscious man. (laughs) This is so brilliant. I hope that this can go in a book. You know, what I hear is that I, I, I love it because myself, I've been all that. I've done that, you know, and the deeper I go, the simpler it gets. And I really value the simple messages of spirituality because the mind can really get in the way. You even joked about that earlier before we press record here. Um, and I guess my question is if, if you can share about how people can, how can they have things be simple? How can they have things be really well, simple? Well, it, 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 first of all, they're already simple, right? And yeah. Mm-hmm. And the mind complicates it, right? That, that saying that, the mind is a wonderful, wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Mm-hmm. And um, what I end up with that piece is that rather than going through all of these tedious, long-winded, self-serving explanations about spirituality, that we, that we engage more in the practice of what it means to be humane. Mm-hmm. To be humane really re- does not require an explanation. We know what mm-hmm. being humane is, mm-hmm. and, and humane is the 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 uh, the verbal the verb of 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 what it means the, of, the verb of spirituality. And spirituality, you know, it's kind of it's it's not, it's kind of a noun, right? Like love is a verb. Love is a verb. Uh, uh, exhibiting our humanity is a verb. You know, mm-hmm. is it humane that that we have people in the richest country in the world um, living and starving to death? Uh, is it humane that 
that um, people in this country don't have clean water to drink. These are not political issues. These right. are issues of humanity. Right. And, right. Um, and especially since we have the resources to remedy these things. Mm. And, and so while, you know, while people are arguing the merits or demerits of, of, um, of, of um, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Maxine Waters, that gap in between is where all the toxicity gets to ferment into a poison that we can't even begin to imagine and uh, and uh, and gives us the illusion that it's irreparable i don't wow. think any of that stuff's irreparable. Um, right. Right. and i don't think you got to be like an airy fairy hippy dippy make sure you talk this way or talk that way kind of person you know mm-hmm. people are really getting crazy with what to say how what, what kind of words to say now granted i'll the first to tell you that words are important Mm-hmm. But I think policy is even more important. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and that when people make a policy, a policy is, is for all intents and purposes, a policy and a budget are, are moral documents. With every, much of, every bit of the gravitas as a Ten Commandments and whatever passage you want to take out of whatever holy, holy book. When you look at a when you look at a policy and you look at the budget that corresponds with that policy, you are looking at a moral document, mm-hmm. and that is where the moral priorities are. Mm-hmm. And and if we um, if we if we augment those, if we tailor those to correspond to what we all know is right and wrong, mm-hmm. and I know this sounds like you know like airy fairy stuff. This is not coming from a hippie that grew up on kale on a, you know, on a carrot farm. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, surrounded by gangsters and, you know, the, the, uh, with, you know, with a really violent, violent background and horrible Catholic uh, experiences. So I, it's not like I haven't been exposed to the dark side of the world. I didn't, you know, grow up out of the Red Rock you know, and into the middle of a crossing ley line and vortex. Well, but that's the thing. I mean, that's where you bring your medicine from what you've experienced. You bring the knowledge from and the, you know, things that you've experienced into your life, which is one of the things I really respect about you. You are a drug counselor. You are a counselor for people that have been through the things that you have walked through. And I feel like, you know, until people go through their personal transformation, can they really, you know, support others in that. But what you're saying is, you know, policy is equally as spiritual as everything. And I I love that because a lot of us feel disconnected from creating, you know, change. And the political climate is such a mess that it turns a lot of people off to want to, there's a big movement for people to really disconnect, you know, in their minds, as Jill reminds us, we're all connected. And I want to hear about that you know, in a few minutes here too, but it, it brings up, you know, this, um, kind of disassociation and desire to pretend that you're, that the system doesn't affect you and can affect you, but that's not really true. The, the problem that human beings have, I believe, you know, and, and believe me, I'm not married to this stuff. I may discover, I may, I may be Mm. gifted with another insight tomorrow it doesn't mean that i'm wishy-washy that's the whole point of learning you know like, mm-hmm. you know it's it's you know when you're a kid you learn two and two is four and then when you're in graduate school you learn e, e equals mc square didn't mean you changed your mind it means that you know through these travelings you expanded and learn more mm-hmm. you know but at this point it seems to me that <clears throat> all throughout history all throughout human history we have always sought except for a few outliers is, uh, all throughout history, we've always sought for an, for an external solution to an internal dissonance. And through every single technological advancement, serious ones like the Gutenberg Bible uh, or the transatlantic cable or the telegraph or the telephone, um, all of the, after, after all of these uh, accomplishments, this, the, the, the dialogue was exactly the same. So after the printing press, this is going to 
you know, this is going to level the playing field. This is going to be an egalitarian experience. It's going to bring people together. Didn't do that. Transatlantic cable, the same exact word. The, the telegraph, the same exact word. The internet, the same exact word. The telephone, the same exact words. I did a paper on this. And each, each, each one, and, and on a side note, just for fun, at the turn of the century, there was a song called can you hear me now? And it's about a guy trying to tell this woman over a party line that he loves her, but there's four of the people on the line and through the song, he keeps saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Well, that was 2000, that was 1910. And you can go through any street in America right now and stand there for five minutes. And I guarantee you, you'll hear somebody say, can you hear me now? You know, uh, which I think is, is, is such a you know, such an indicator how nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. And until we go through a period of serious, serious self-inquiry mm -hmm. um, and then share that self-inquiry inquiry with somebody that is that is uh, reliable and trustworthy um, to reflect that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, nothing's going to change. We'll probably get a good iPhone 15 and not a goddamn thing will change. Wow. That is so freaking huge. And I love how you bring it all out and then bring it back in, bring it back home to the power of self-inquiry. I have a question for you both as a couple. I'd love to hear from Jill. How has self-inquiry supported your relationship as a couple? Because I know you're a conscious couple. I know you live in Sedona. I know you do a lot of cool shit and you have a beautiful spiritual community, but even spiritual community and vegan clothes don't give us what self-inquiry does. So from a couple perspective, how has it helped you? And let's just start there. How has it helped you? After you, mm -hmm. uh, as a as self inquiry as a couple. So, um, how has self inquiry helped you in your relationship? How has that been beneficial well, in relationship? The, the phrase "we can be ourselves together" um, mm. keeps coming to me in that in that uh, really you know you don't I don't have I don't have expectations of Frank and letting him just be who he is. And I love who he is mm. and vice versa. And uh, I support him in any venture he wants to do. And he, he does the same for me. Mm. And um, I think that just, you know, letting go of, of uh, former expectations or what we're, we're supposed to, you know, quote, have in your life, you know, have mm. things, material things or, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, certain, certain, um, mm -hmm. marked, uh, marked, um, advances in your careers, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. It's just, um, to me, it's just, it's just being, I love yeah. just being myself and, and, and being with him. Mm. Being. Mm. Um, I'm going to guess that you didn't, Mm, that you weren't born with the ability to just let people be where they are, Jill. Right. Well, and I'm wondering I'm what. All, I think we're all born with that ability, but it's shaken out of us. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> weren't condi you didn't grow up always thinking that, and so I'm curious what it is that you had to let go of without getting you know into the intricacies of your story because of time and respecting your privacy mm -hmm. as well. Um, what kind of patterns you had to let go of? Because I think, you know, it's good for us to talk about philosophy, but what's real is that we get stuck in, in patterns that are right. So unconsciously ingrained based on the lie that the outside makes us happy and mm -hmm. that someone else is responsible for our state of being. And so I'm wondering what thoughts or beliefs or energetics that you've 
been able to let go. If you can remember them, let go of to, because it seems so easy. You're like, yeah, we just meet each other where we are and we respect and honor each other. And that sounds good, but there's so much codependency, you know, rampant in the world. What well, have you, you know, let go of? Yeah, please. Go ahead. No, please. You go ahead. Well, you got it. I was just going to say, you know, I've learned how to um, have uh, to not have expectations by my past relationships mm. and what what didn't work for me and what did work for me and uh, just letting, no expectations. letting the other person be who they who they be their truth, be the truth of themselves. And if they mm-hmm. need to go and search for that, let them go search for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How does that tie in when you have certain needs um, that you want met when you don't have any expectations to your partner? Mm. How are you yeah. able to but get the, your needs met the, when you don't have expectations? Is that a question for either one of us? Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, well, I, I would say that that here's where the courage in a relationship where an an opportunity for courage in a relationship is uh, to be honest. Mm. Um, if I if I say you know, because usually in in life in general, but particularly in relationships, you want you you know if a sure a sure fire a sure fire way of generating mishigas is not taking care of yourself and not being honest, which kind of are connected. But when you when you when you when you're not honest and not honest meaning not giving the the information the other person needs to make it to make a, a sound decision, right? Mm-hmm. That's not honest. Not you know, it doesn't have to upfront like be a lie. It could just be the omission of information that will mm-hmm. that would have enabled the other person. Right, right. To make a sound decision. Which requires you so, often being honest with yourself, right? Too. Well, yeah. Step one, right? Right. Step one, too. So, um, really, it's just about like you know, Brene Brown talks about this. You know, who, mm-hmm. you know, who will the the points of vulnerability? Who's going to initiate sex first? You know, who's oh, mm-hmm. redundant? Who's going to initiate sex? Or, um, you know, waiting a week for the mammogram, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. You know, uh, being the first person, you know, the first person to ask, would you? like to go out with me, I like you. Things like that require a degree of vulnerability. People, people admire us for our accomplishments. They fall in love with us because of our vulnerability. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's something that's really hard for people to incorporate because of the, anticip- you know, the, because of the, uh, the anticipation of the fear. And by the way, my favorite the definition of fear Mm-hmm. is the anticipation of future pain. Mm-hmm. So I, I, that's, that's my opinion. I think, uh, I, you know, it's, and one of the things about this particular relationship, and, one of, uh, and just on, on, on an aside, uh, in The Course in Miracles, one of my favorite lines in The Course in Miracles is the purpose of the sacred relationship is to midwife each other's perfections. Mm. And and I, I, I just when I first read that read that line, I was speechless. You know, and and what this relationship has done is I, I've been a Jill creates a space where I'm willing to take the risk to be just a little more honest than I was gonna be. You know, I was gonna mm. be mostly honest, <laughs> like mostly, not totally, mm. but then she creates an atmosphere where you know, I said, you know what? Throw all the cards on the table. See what happens. I and I it. throw all the cards on the tables and she says, do we have any more zucchini? I'm cooking tonight. You know, like, <laughs> you know, what card? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I keep getting surprised. It's sort of like I put something on the table. I expect it to catch fire. Next thing I know, I got to get it off the table because dinner's coming. So it, mm-hmm. it, and and it, it, I make up I make up the narrative in my head. You know, I think the narrative in my head is so loud that she could hear it. You know, mm-hmm. but she can't mm-hmm. because she's holding and it's, you know, the frequency because she's not having expectations and she's following. It sounds like Jill, you're following your own vision for things too. Yeah. 
Well, sometimes when she says, what are you thinking? And I honestly answer her, she starts cracking up. <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking the end of the world's coming. There's a tsunami and there's a forest fire and the glaciers are coming down. That's what's in my head. So, I, I, you know, I give her my narrative and she just laughs at me. She goes, just be home in time for dinner. And, I like, and so as it, <laughs> nice. that happens over and over again, mm-hmm. you start feeling comfortable in the stadium, you know, it's you start, healing. You start, thinking, yeah, 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 you know? yeah. It's interesting. Then, I, uh, the mm-hmm. bad part. About, here's the bad part about that: that you start realizing, like, it's all my shit. You know? Right. <laughs> That's the part that I don't like. Oh my god, this is my shit. You know, it's not hers. She's mm-hmm. not responding or reacting or even acknowledging. It's just like it's not nothing. It's no reality. It doesn't have. It doesn't have a link. There's not one, even not one capillary connected to reality. I get it. I get it. No, I get it. Your stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting is I asked the question to Jill about what she had to let go of in the past to be available for a relationship where two people can meet each other where they are and honor and respect one another so deeply with no expectation with, without expectation. And your answer is like, it's a process. Actually, her and tell me if this is, feels accurate. It's actually like her love and the way she's showing up is actually supporting you in the process of continuing to let go of your own fear response um, and embrace more abundance and growth and love and, and surprises. Yeah, you know why? Because she's not crazy. <laughs> I, well, well, there's tip number crazy. two. Yeah. Oh, fall she's in love with someone. She's not crazy. Like, uh-huh. and, you know, she's like from a nice little farm in Wyoming, and I'm from like a mafia ghetto in New York. She's well, okay. Crazy. I'm going to jump in in that story for a second because my dad is from Brooklyn. I'm a third generation New Yorker. So my dad grew up in Brooklyn. There was mafia family around our grandparents. I, my, my grandpa who passed away very young, was a bookie. So I get it. Okay. And my dad who passed last year, God rest his soul. He, he was like, you know, personality. I mean, my joke is like, he's like a little Woody Allen without all the creepy vibes, like a little bald Brooklyn dude. Okay. Little bald Brooklyn dude. Who's like, you want something, get it done. You don't have money. Get up early. Everything's practical, 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 practical. And my stepmom, who is his second wife, Beth, who I love is, was a little bit like Jill, but also grew up in Brooklyn. Okay. She grew up also in Brooklyn, but she has this very gentle, she was actually in the incubators at Coney Island and like in a book about, um, the miracle baby who was like on display. Cause she was very small and she has the gentlest, most loving, compassionate attitude and presence. And it completely changed my dad's life to have the versus my fiery mom. So. I love what you're sharing. And I think that you could be from anywhere and, and have different kinds of disposition and understanding your stories is wonderful, but I'm guessing Jill, you've also, it hasn't always been easy for you because earlier Frank told me off, you know, recording that, you know, you met when you were playing this heartbreaking love song (laughs) about some experience that touched on heartbreak. So again, I'm just curious, Jill, for you, because you're in this moment presenting to us as this angel, perfect person. And I'm curious (laughs) what it, what it is that's true that you've like, because I want people to be able to identify how to, what to let go of that's keeping them from experiencing the fulfillment. Now, I mean, Frank, that's questions for you too, but first, Jill, what have you let go of? Is it expectation? Is that something that you felt like you used to have? Did you already answer it? Well, I I, I was under the impression that um, my partner ha- was responsible for my happiness. Okay. And vice versa. I was okay. in relationships where they they felt that I was responsible for their happiness, and that's just not true. Just not true. You, you know, everybody responsible for themselves, and um, mm-hmm. it's it really is letting letting go of any you know of that kind of an expectation That's i mean right. there, there are there are things that you want in a relationship i you know i expect 
I expect Frank to be, you know, faithful to me and, and honest to me. And, and, mm. uh, but I just accept that he is. Right. And Beautiful. He is. I love it. I love it. Great. How about you, Frank? What is it that you feel like um, maybe you've shifted out of that's enabled you to be ready for this amazing partnership that you're in now? Is there anything you can see? I, I, I like the wording shift, shifted out of because letting go for me, um, you know, I sometimes frame it in a in a joking way, mm-hmm. but it, 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 in a sense, it's it's a joke. It's real. I, I don't know over the years, um, um, over the years, if I've ever let go of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, what's happened is certainly a lot of those things are less powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, right. you know, so the, I don't, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, the, I give a shit. I don't give, you know, I say, you, you know, you're a worthless piece of shit thought cloud that comes by me and sometimes assaults me. But now a lot of those things are, are not as powerful, but they're all, I think they're all still there, mm. but there have been shifts where, I'm I'm far more comfortable with certain things, you know. Like, you know, like I I I still have a lot of those neuroses. The, the thing about letting go also it's become a sort of a, a sort of mantra where where, where you're talk. I have this idea for a, and Jill's heard this before. She'll so bear with me. I I have this idea for a story where I'm broken hearted <clears throat> and I'm walking and the pain that you know you see me in the background walking. And somebody, uh, you know, somebody's walking toward me and we know each other. You don't hear what we're saying. And I tell the guy, that, you know, the guy, obviously I'm sad. And I tell the guy what's going on. And again, nobody hears it. And at one point, he puts his, sh- his hand on my shoulder. And as he does that, I pull out a pistol and blow his brains out and kill him on the spot. The next scene is we're in court. And the, you know, and the... Uh, I got because I summarily get arrested. I'm in court, and uh, the judge comes on and hear you, hear you. The General John Smith is presiding. Uh, please be seated. And Bela Bailiff, the first uh, first case, first case, Your Honor, as Frank Ferrante. What's the charge? Murder in the first degree. Mr. Ferrante, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, Your Honor, I was really feeling bad and brokenhearted, and I ran into this guy, and I told him the story. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and he says, just let it go. So I shot him. And the judge goes, case dismissed, justifiable homicide. You know? So, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Letting so, go. Yeah, I mean, to what that equates to me is, is, is like when women, because I work a lot with people on relationship issues and I work mostly with women, is when women are trying to get men to express their feelings. And it, thinking like Alison Armstrong, who's an amazing, enlightened relationship teacher, says, um, you know, don't expect your man to be a hairy woman. And so when women are expecting men to have like the same interest in like talking about feelings all day, like often women do all the time, that usually finally when the man tells him, then he's really angry and freaks out. And then she gets upset that he's angry. Kind of a story. Y'all know that one? That's very common when people start doing no, but I, I, I get it I, you yeah. know the thing is i talk about feelings a lot because i'm with a lot of wounded people yeah and it, and it it comes easily to me as a matter of fact it's are the, they're the conversations that mm-hmm. i find the most fulfilling and gratifying and redemptive because considering all the mistakes and craziness and people i've hurt that if i couldn't somehow be a part of their redemption, their salvation and their redemption, then I have no purpose on earth mm-hmm. that because I, because of all the mistakes that I've made and all the people that I've hurt. And if I can't do something to help usher people into their own well being, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what's the point of me being yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. We understand that to, to me, I understand that through the lens of karma like when there's, I, I can relate with the, the feeling that you're talking about of suffering where you feel, you feel it, you feel the impact of what you've done that's hurt others. 
And the only way that you can amend is through love, forgiveness. And I love that you help people with their feelings because you wouldn't be able to if you weren't willing to feel yours. So it shows me that um, integrity that you walk with. Good job. And thank you. Well, thank you. You know, the, 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 irony, the, the paradox is, or the irony of the paradox, I'm not sure which, mm-hmm. is, is that, um, you know, I'm supposed to let go of these things. And it's yet these very things that I find reference to 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 communicate you know, to communicate with people, I have to draw on these reference points, right? That I'm supposed to be letting go of, that are you know constantly being renewed. You know, there's something strange about it. You know, there's yeah. that old uh, Chinese. I think it's Lao Tzu who says, "He who knows doesn't speak, and he who speaks doesn't know." Which kind of lands me in a peculiar kind of place, you know, <laughs> that mm-hmm. I somehow got to manage and still maintain some degree of like, you know, non ass hold them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, it's uh, it's uh, the uh, the irony doesn't escape me, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, mm-hmm. I just think that uh, I, I just think that I'll probably spend when I die the next the first twenty four hours I'll be just spending laughing so hard it will rain on earth that is that's awesome <laughs> oh my laughing he's like you thought that was important jesus what a schmuck <laughs> oh you are funny yesterday i was being interviewed on my friend edward wiley's podcast that's coming out this year and um he was he's a leader and works with men in the bay area male leadership on self-leadership it's about doing you, you know, and working on yourself, not trying to figure out how to solve everyone else's problems, but first to healing yourself, coming into peace with yourself, finding your own center. And he was asking me how to, what I would say if I was supporting somebody who's so stressed out that they just can't calm down and have time to um, meditate, for example, because we were talking about meditation. And he said, is there any way you can, can you answer it without being spiritual because some of my people aren't spiritual. And I was like, okay, let's see, let's see how I can do this. And I actually couldn't in that moment, because I think that understanding our, our, our energy for, for my work, my work is helping people, you know, understand how their energy affects their lives, whether it's your nervous system being crazy or tuning into your spirit, understanding that we, that you're not who you think you are. You're not your negative ego. You're not even your positive ego. And that there's a freedom when we work with energy. And I said, I can't, I don't think I, I could. I think that if, if you are ignoring that part of who you are, you may, you know, don't, you know, just take a moment and start to be curious about who you are beyond your story that you can't do whatever. And that there's something much bigger that can help you because it's actually helpful (laughs) like to understand. And I understand like religions really messed us up. So I understand the resistance, but why not see things for what they are and see who you are and know who you are and start to be curious about who you are because there's freedom in that. And it was like, okay, all right. You know, and of course you can learn to sit still, grab a cup of tea, turn off all your devices and just stare in nature and breathe. You know, there's a practical non-spiritual philosophy for you. But there's so much resistance to um, to self-inquiry, I think, and, and the busy, even now I'm surprised people are still busy. You know, the universe just sent you to your room for two years. You're still really busy. <laughs> um, how do you, Frank, how do you, um, how do you help people to find the thing that's keeping them from the freedom and happiness and joy that they really are seeking? I, I, I have, uh, you know, it, it, it really kind of chokes me up, but I have, I have a, a magic lamp in a way. Um, 
you know, my uh, the film that I was in, mm -hmm. I, I had I, I went through a number of incarnations about about my connection to the film. And the first part was purely egocentric and like, oh, look at me, I have a film. But mm -hmm. then when you're not looking at me, I'm in my hotel room, crying, you know, cowering because oh my god, they want to find me out. Mm -hmm. Until I evolved to a place where, and through maturity and cuts and scrapes, um, um, realized the film is a tool. Mm -hmm. The film is a, is a tool. And what it does is, is people can look at this film and see an ordinary guy, not a Tony Robbins guy, not a rich person with a big mansion, mm -hmm. not a person with access to all kinds of famous people to come help them heal, but a very regular working class immigrant from Brooklyn, you know, really just bumbling around trying to figure out, you know, like really basically what the next step is and what's it, hey, hey, can you tell me a good way not to kill myself today kind of place. Mm -hmm. And in that film, shift from a guy that was not just physically overweight, but emotionally tortured, and then to somehow step by step with help, transcend into a place where, okay, I can now get into the game. I can now, I could now get into the track star. I can now get into the basketball game. I can now get into the driver's seat. You know what I mean? It doesn't I mean, it's not a film where like a Tony Robbins thing, where you work, you walk on fire and all of a sudden you're so great. You need penis reduction surgery. You know, it's not like that. It's, it's a, uh, and it, it, it's a it's an incremental walk towards the possibility it is. of of of, re, mm -hmm. of of getting your life back, yes. and and so that's my that's my magic tool that I have that mm -hmm. ha, that came about as really not because I knew what I was doing. It was mm -hmm. on the contrary. It's because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so what what I offer people is the same thing with the four minute mile. Before the four minute mile was broken, it was this ideal. Once the four minute mile was broken, about a half a dozen people broke it that year and now it's commonplace. And that's what it is mm. to me. And so, and, and, and it doesn't mean that everything goes away. There's no happily ever after, wherever that is. There's, there's just, okay, here, man, you're, we, we can get you to the place where you're at you're, if you want to do Monopoly, you're at go with $200. Mm -hmm. And the dice, you know, they're in your hand. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, to me, that's, that's when I'm, what I try to do with humor and, mm -hmm. and, and also my person, my being there. You know, right. that they see a person, actually, the actual person that did it, not a spokesperson. So I got mm -hmm. a few years left of doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and some really remarkable things have happened over the years be because of it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, you know, and, and, and to, to your point, if I may backtrack a moment about the self, you were talking about self-inquiry and, mm -hmm. you know, addiction is, addiction is a really wonderful metaphor. It's a really, it's very, from a, from a, from a, um, uh, uh, from an, from as an oratory metaphor. For what's mm -hmm. going on so one of the most difficult things in the steps of it people don't understand people that i call them civilians people that are not familiar with the drug thing drug yeah. drug addiction and alcoholism i refer to them as civilians civilians don't get what the process is like it's not just not drinking not drinking enables you to engage in the genuine in earnest process of recovery Right. And part of that process of recovery is a, a terrifying self-inquiry. Right? What I tell people is, you know, I didn't really recover when I put down the dope and the, the booze. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that, that gave me access to, <clears throat> to the recovery. Right. My right. recovery started a while after I had stopped drinking. Mm -hmm. And one moment, I was completely assaulted with the consciousness and reality of what what my behavior had caused other people. Mm -hmm. And it was a crushing moment where I, I literally was paralyzed. And mm -hmm. all the thoughts, the thoughts of all the people that I had hurt, 
all the people that I had not attended to, all the people I took something away from, basically the full weight in Technicolor and Panavision came to me in one sitting. And at that point is when my recovery started, when I began the road of cleaning all those things up, which Mm -hmm. meant facing the people that I had hurt, Mm -hmm. facing the people that I had robbed, facing the people that I had ignored, Mm -hmm. all of those things, one by one by one, and each time feeling like I was going to have a heart attack. Now, what's the difference between me and a government, which is made up of people, Mm -hmm. right? Or just your neighbor. Who who wants, I I did it because I had a gun to my head. I knew that if I didn't do these things, I'd go back to drugs and alcohol. So there was a certain a further impetus for me to, to engage in this stuff that I was terrified about. But what's the difference between the world we live in? It requires the same thing. That's why the Civil War is still going on. That's why people are scared to, without even knowing what they're scared about. It's because they're not looking inward. Mm-hmm. And if they did, they'd be a lot less afraid and probably make more decisions that were in alignment with with keep with helping their brothers and sisters. Yeah. I, I hope Beautiful. that wasn't too long. When- no, it's, it's important. It's um, in my school. And when I train people, there's a point when we invite them to have the conversations, you know, that are difficult where it's not like addiction recovery, where it's necessarily an apology. It may be a conversation that, give somebody a chance to express their feelings or their needs or ask for what they want, or ju- it's really to make peace. I mean, that's the same intention to be able to, to thank them for the past. If apology needs to be there so that they can move forward with the energetics of respect and gratitude and, and love. And whether you never talk to that person again, or it's somebody you live with, And the way that we prepare is because I'm, you know, as an energy healer and I, I guess I still am an energy healer, um, you know, is really working with your own nervous system to like calm down, ground, clear, cleanse, get in your heart, connect to your, your body and get yourself ready to have those conversations so that you could be honest and, um, and be the source of what you're creating, you know, be empowered to know that you can create peace through doing these difficult things and that it actually only happens when we're uncomfortable (laughs) because otherwise, if we're just too comfortable, we won't make those changes, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you bringing that in. Um, so are there, any final things that either of you feel like are really important on this topic of, you know, healing or creating love, um, world peace, whatever you want to share. We we've kind of gone wide and I, I'm just flowing with it. Like you all are with it today. Um, anything. You want to some, share? Well, you know, um, years ago, I, I, um, uh, uh, I was living in San Francisco and I was, uh, it was going through a, a little shadowy time. I was not feeling good and inside, and spiritually not feeling good. And a friend of mine said, and this is, to- this is completely germane to what you're talking about. And, uh, and uh, I was at her apartment and she goes, you know, we should go. She goes, I, I've started doing something I really enjoy doing. And I said, what? She goes, uh, I go to these tea ceremonies. And my first thought was, Well, first, she's polite. So, you know, I have to be polite and say yes. But I go, a tea ceremony, I'm going to be bored out of my mind. Nevertheless, it's San Francisco. Francisco. I went to Chinatown. And you give 15 bucks. And and there's a docent. And they have every single tea that's ever been made ever. And Mm -hmm. it's in Chinatown. And and, uh, they give you a little lecture here, there. They talk about different teas. And then you start sampling them. And they bring you uh, a flight, what I guess, and drinks, drinks what we call, call the flight deck. And it's like six different little glasses of, of tea. And it's like six, maybe 12 little um, small caps of tea. Mm-hmm. And the, the docent began explaining 
how the how teas are made and she said teas that grow unencumbered in fertile soil with rich uh, rich soil and uh, and and sunlight unencumbered sunlight tend to grow quickly uh but when brewed tend to be very very mild mm. and she said there are other teas that have to grow through briar patches and shadow and have to struggle for light and struggle on on very coarse terrain but when they grow and when they're brewed tend mm. to be much more robust and much darker with a deeper flavor and i almost started to get misty because i said that's how i grew up <laughs> you know mm. that's how i grew up with my friends and they are in fact more lively and darker and richer in spirit and stories mm-hmm. and you know sometimes that's just the way life is and nature there are metaphors all over the place in nature for how we grow up there are like these silent silent in- indicators and tablets with no alphabet yet there there are lessons on these tablets that don't really speak with any alphabet but if you listen hard enough you can feel and see some way of being that may make your next step just a little easier and mm. um it's taking me a lifetime to be able to even begin on a first grade level to look at these things mm. and and just because you have a hard life doesn't mean that god hates you or that you were ordained a certain way but maybe maybe you were supposed to be a warrior whose only training was like this and um and to find somehow find the light and find the beauty in other people that will align with you to help you on your next step mm-hmm. um i i by against all odds am with a woman that just uh, blows my mind all the time and occasionally I jokingly say, and she doesn't like it, do you have me confused with somebody else? (laughs) (laughs) You know, because, you know, and so, uh, you know, I'm still standing. I'm 70 years old. I've done it. I've done mountains of cocaine, mountains of heroin, barrels of vodka, you know, 175,000 cigarettes, conservative accounting, and I'm still here with my brain relatively intact and my sense of humor still going on. And for some reason, people want to know what I did to be still standing like you. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, no matter when I go to the darkness, I have to look at the evidence. And, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope no, it's good. Thank you. What, what I heard was, um, keep going with what's, what's next in front of you. Like, what is your next thing? you know, that you need like, and, and get the support. And I've heard you say that you also have a lot of mentors in addition to this amazing woman. Um, thank you, Jill, any final words that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, just the, the, the most important takeaway in my life is that we're all one. We're all meant to, to remember that we are, we're all connected to each other and to everyone. And, and to everything, every, every living thing on this planet. Yes, that's right. That's right. I, I feel like the, um, some of the biggest pain is that we, um, that we think we're separate and not connected and it's just not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Frank and Jill for joining us today. Um, how can people follow up with both of you? Oh, well, how can they follow up with them? Well, I, I guess the, uh, the the new technical way of they could telegram us. <laughs> or, uh, Frank, or, Frank has a website. We could give you our, Jill and I could give you our website. Yes, Frank yeah, is, what uh, are your websites? Mm-hmm. Frank, may I be Frank Ferranti? Mm-hmm. Dot com. Mm-hmm. And I'm com. Mm-hmm. And I have a um, book there that I'm working on, which is. Uh, a monument, a 30 foot high uh, monument uh, dedicated to the, the, the 
the thinking of we are one it's a unity and love monument amazing amazing i'd love to talk with you more about that sometime that would be awesome okay well you have our number <laughs> well like i know where to find y'all right in the center line, ley lines of the vortex in sedona so <laughs> thank you so much that's what, that's what we that's why we don't commit crime anymore. We're too easy to find. <laughs> too easy to find. Yeah, it keeps you out of trouble. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed listening to today's episode, and I sure hope you did, you can listen to Awaken Life Radio wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. To join the conversation, hop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Awakened Life Tribe. You can join us there and share any thoughts, feelings, insights, or questions that you have from listening to Awaken Life Radio, and we can interact and connect more 